play at Novabet. Hello and a warm welcome to another edition of the Irish Angle in association with Nobby Bet. As usual, I've Emma Nagel, Johnny Ward here, and we're going to go through all the different things going on in Irish and British racing at the moment. Johnny, Emma, welcome to the show. Thanks, Hi, Vinny. Now, start off, the first thing is some very sad news at the weekend about Kilbegan Racecourse Manager, um, Paddy Dunnigan, who died suddenly. It really is a bit of a shock now to everyone within the game, and our thoughts and prayers go out to his family, friends, colleagues, and everything. Kilbegan won't be the same. He's been there all my life in Kilbegan anyway as manager. Johnny, you'd have known him well, would you? Yeah, like uh, in terms of the race course, I dealt with from my time starting in the racing post, um, which, you know, it goes back a few years now. Um, I, I'd honestly say I might have dealt with Paddy Dunnigan more than any other race course manager. Um, and on Saturday, I was on off the ball um, in studio talking about football. And at about 25 to 5, I got a text in. Um, and I have to say, I was absolutely rattled, Vinny. Like, it's, it, I wouldn't say I was close friends with Paddy, but it absolutely rattled me. And I'm, I'm still rattled from it. Um, and I spoke to some people about it yesterday. Um, it's, it's, it's genuinely devastating. Um, you know, Paddy wasn't, I think it's fair to say, he wasn't everyone's cup of tea. He ruffled a few feathers here and there. Um, but my last memory of him was um, we were racing last year. It was, uh, it's hard to believe it now, but it was a hot day in September very hot day and I think it was the second meet in a row where he came over to myself and the the cameraman and just got us an ice cream and I know it was only a small gesture but it meant and the work on a long day at Kilbegan race and um, and the nature of his deaths um is really really profound um I, I'm quite devastated by it in the sense of somebody that I can't say I knew all that well um, but from my dealings with him, um, I would have known him pretty well down the years. And um, I always felt he was trying to push Kilbegan. Um, you know, I thought he, he made a bad mistake with the, you know, the five race courses that kind of were threatening to break away last year. But in the end, he he helped me out for a piece when it was probably quite a difficult thing to do and um, that I wrote in the business post about it. Um, and I would just implore anyone um, who was in the situation that he found himself in, um, on Friday evening to, to please talk to people, please talk to people that um, Paddy was 61 years of age and um, he'd done wonders for Kilbegan Racecourse. And it saddens me to the core that um, he felt that this was um, the way out for him at this stage of his life, that he, he felt that that lost. And um, I'm, I'm genuinely devastated. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, Anyway, look, there's no more talking about it. Poor old Paddy is gone. That's the end of it now at this stage. Uh, we'll move on. Weather is the big one at the moment. Last week or two, we've had serious issues with weather. Um, race meetings cancelled all around us. Even the ones that are on have very, very heavy ground. We've got Aintree this week. Um, their ground is also an issue for them. It's soft at the moment on the Grand National Course and also on the Hurdle and Chase Courses. There's also a heavy stretch for around three furlongs around the canal turn. Um Heavy rain, they're due this morning. They're due some more rain Tuesday and Wednesday. So what do you think, Emma? It's going to be a hell of a week um, for horses going four miles, two furlongs around the Grand National Course and that sort of conditions. Yeah, you'd have to imagine, like, you'd be worried. Is, is it guaranteed to even go ahead? And, like, just the, geez, the rain we're getting here, like, it's rain for weeks upon weeks upon weeks. And I think they had he heavy rain over the weekend in Liverpool as well. And if it continues to rain all week long, um, like coming up towards Saturday, you'd maybe even have to be worried about, you know, the Grand National, if, if, it, if it will go ahead. So hopefully it'll, it'll calm down a bit, but it'll definitely kind of affect the chances of other horses. Cher Cannon will be cursing it for sure um, after skipping Cheltenham and heading to Aintree with Hewitt. Um, probably very unlikely he's going to run this type of ground. But um, like it's, it's not really what you'd expect from Aintree. I suppose you're kind of a, always having that nice kind of spring ground, kind of a, a sunny um, atmosphere around the track. So, um. Yeah, the weather has been absolutely crazy. Like last week, we had the like, Clamel, Wexford, um, the Cora, loads of meetings cancelled down Patrick as well. Um, and there's been so many cancelled now. Like in fairness, Ireland are very good for rescheduling, but there's, there's so many now. I'd say to be a hard job to fit them all in over the next few weeks for what just down. So yeah, it's chaotic this time of the year. I, I can never remember this so much rain falling. Yeah, you're always on about this, Johnny. Climate change. I don't know whether it's climate change or what it is, but it's very it's very frustrating from a racing point of view. 
unfortunately it is Vinny like it is climate change and I mean I was talking about that day in, in Kilbegan last year and it was it was I remember the sweat pouring down my back and I, I was basically sitting at a at a table and then, that was in September and uh, I was kind of thinking um, geez this weather is mad for the time of year but I did not forecast this and certainly didn't forecast the amount of rain that England has gotten um, and the amount of cancellations that they've had I was supposed to work at Wexford three times in St. Patrick's Day all, all meetings were called off you have a four week period the race course have a four week period. I was told it last week, um, in which they can, um, have one go at a refixture, and after that they're out. And the, a, a run of the mill meeting being cancelled, I'm told, costs about fifty grand to a race course. That's colossal money, and like I have massive sympathy for the race course managers, particularly in the south and the southeast. Um, you know, Emma's Emma's in a part of the country that's got an awful lot of rain. It's coming from the south, and it seems that the the rain that's coming from the south is worse than the the the, the old rain we used to get, which is kind of more coming from the west. It nearly was like once it got to Gaul, we stopped for a pint, and kind of the rest of the country wasn't too bad. But now it's kind of it's been uh, it's it's a different kind of band of rain that we've been getting. Um, for the for actually for racing, it's obviously bad, but I'd be desperately worried for um the farming industries um in ireland that you know they're in in in, in existential crisis at the moment and for racing in terms of feed and all that this is going to be a massive uh, headache on top of uh, issues that trainers have and entry looks pretty okay from sort of thursday on but as Emma mentioned uh, Vinny, the the next few days could be could be quite bad and um I, I don't think I don't think you know racing has really um, embraced this um, yet in terms of talking about the the, the, the challenges they will face. Johnny Mullen has gone into the new role of of HR. I think he, he started last month and it's been a baptism of fire with all the race meetings cancelled. But I've been on to Jim Martin at Dundalk kind of just off the record and they're more than ready to to, to run more meetings if needs be. And to be honest, I'd say it's long odds on that Dundalk will need to show, will need to run races this year that otherwise would have been on turf that's essentially been waterlogged now for weeks. Yeah, true. And look, hopefully it improves in the next month anyway because we've got Ferry, or sorry, Punchestown coming up as well. You'd like to think there'd be better ground for there. The forecast, the the Vinny, for kind of... There's a, a, fair, a somewhat optimistic forecast for the latter half, maybe two thirds of April, um, being good, and that would be massive, massive, massive for Punchdown, and and desperately, desperately needed as well. Yeah, I should say for the farming community too. Anyway, looking looking at Willie Mull, or um, yeah, Willie Mullins, he's going to be champion trainer here again for the umpteen time. Is there half a chance he's going to be champion trainer in the UK as well? He's seven hundred thousand quid behind. Dan Skelton and Paul Nichols in the trainer's title at the moment. If he happened to have the first and second in the Grand National on Saturday, he goes level with him. It's 500,000 to the winner, 200,000 per second. Whatever way you look at it, Emma, he's going to be a contender, is he? Yeah, saying having first and second in the National seems like a steep enough task, but I suppose with Willie Mullins, um, you definitely wouldn't rule it out. Like He's, some, he's a really fancy one. He's 11 in the, in the National, I think, and the likes of I am Maximus and Meeting of the Waters, all fairly well fancied for Yeah, I think he's around 700,000 behind at the moment. Um, I think he's actually shortened up a little bit in the betting since I last looked at it. I think he was around 5-1 to one last week, but he's around about 3-1 to one now. I think Paul Nichols is still kind of odds on to regain it, but I just I'd say Willie is shortening just because of the amount of entries he has in the UK over the next few weeks, like it's fairly eye catching. Even taking out um like all the grade ones in entry, like he's kind of sending a bit of a B team over there, I suppose. Probably still able to win a fair few of them with that B team, but just the handicaps I think later on, even um in the month in the UK, like I think he has. I think he has he's five in the Scottish um champion or idol, ten in the Scottish Grand National, I think thirteen in the whip ride as well later on in the year. Like those are three handicaps that I don't think he's ever won them. So I can't imagine he would have been targeting him in the past, but like he must have this in the back of his mind that he has he has a real shot at um at getting this UK trainer cycle. And if he won it this year, like it would be some achievement because I'd say it would be half accidentally like um if he looked at it next year and decided I'm gonna set up a little satellite yard in the UK. Um, send over so many horses to run in, in these big handicaps every week. You would imagine um, he'd be fairly hard to beat in that trainer's side. He's only had 14 winners in the UK so far this season. I think Dan Skelton, Dan Skelton who's leading, has it at around 105, 110, that kind of number. So like to be to be within reach of it with a month to go after having 14 winners, um, it's some achievement. And if he, if he had a crack at it next year, I'd see it have a fair go. I think he said in the past he'd like to win it. Um, and if he won it this year, yeah, it would, it would be a fair achievement. He'd probably have less than 20 winners. Um, so it, it would uh, probably win for the record books, right? Yeah, I'm surprised you're saying there that Paul Nichols is favoured to win it because he doesn't even have a runner in the Grand National, which is astonishing, mm-hmm. isn't it? Um, I, I'd be I'd be surprised now if Willie Mullins doesn't win it myself. I think he I think he will. Anyway, um, 
One other thing there, Johnny, around the Grand National as well, is this animal rising crowd who caused havoc last year. They've come out and said a public statement saying they're not going to protest this year. Um, I'd imagine they won't, but then again, I suppose you never know. Maybe they'll catch us by surprise and, and throw a few people out there. What do you make of all that, Johnny? And then the other thing, of course, the British Horse Racing launched a new website this week or last week, uh, racingpwr.co.uk with all the facts and figures about the industry, which is probably a positive thing, is it, to give everyone the ammunition to know the, the true facts behind everything? What do you make of it? Yeah, I was, I was going to chastise you for a rare uh, typo uh, from, from yourself, Vinny, which uh, I have to say, you're, you're rarely uh, a man for the typos when I saw that headline. So it's like, is this actually the, the, the URL for us? Um, but read the piece and it's it's well worth reading if you haven't read it and you're watching and listening in because um, in terms of racing elephants in the room, I think what happens to horses who... Um, don't make the cut, so to speak. Is the is the prim is pri- probably the biggest elephant in the room. The last horse I was involved with, um, I I got in touch with um a former trainer up the north. Her actually name escapes me now, but she's basically gotten into rehoming um horses mainly in Britain, and there's a big demand for them. Um, and it's it's a lovely thing to do, and actually horses that I've been involved in now I can kind of track them on Instagram, and they're loving life. Um, I had a horse that's. Uh, he was he was quite old when he stopped uh, racing, but he's he's kind of gone to England and he's doing different bits of uh, things now post his racing career. He's absolutely loving life and it's lovely to follow them. And like the animal, you know, I I give out a lot about the animal welfare thing in terms of racing because I think they're really um they're targeting a sport that um I think they could be looking at, at at more like the meat industry and all of that. But it is it's definitely um welcome that they're not going to be doing anything at entry. And because last year um inadvertently it possibly resulted in the death of a horse, which is the irony of ironies. But um we we really don't need this at at this stage. Yeah, I think that's Susie Barkley you were referring to, is it? From exactly, North, Susie yeah. Barkley. Sorry, Susie, for forgetting your name. No, yeah. Um, the, the other thing, look, there were some facts and figures in that that, that astounded me. What, one of them being the fact that all the horses that are bred to go for horse racing, 31% of them never make it to a trainer. That, that's, a, that's a huge amount, isn't it? Um, how would you see that, Em, at home? You, you breed horses, I presume. Your dad and everything else. You, you'd like to think that the vast majority of them would make it to... The training ranks at some stage is that uh I, i'm sorry i haven't uh, seen that that uh, study is that like uh, allowing for fatalities kind of early on in their life and i'd say it's allowing for everything somehow yeah it just seems a very high turnover yeah, I... 31 percent never get there i suppose yeah i mean fatalities must be a factor in that um like with us it's a pretty small operation i suppose we've maybe four or five broodmares and uh if they're not sold as a foal or as a as a yearling um they're probably in training here at home so i have a fair idea where they go to anyway so uh, yeah i suppose in the bigger operations the numbers can get a bit lost a bit more but i think like the site in general it's probably um it's a good thing overall even though as you say like maybe some of the statistics need a little bit more clarification but i suppose good timing this time of the year at the grand national it's always the one that brings the the kind of um the the big publicity with the antis and stuff like that but like to hear they're not targeting in this year um, I was kind of surprised, to be honest, because they got so much publicity last year. Maybe they're not <laughs> fans in the rain. They don't want to be standing outside the entry getting a bit of a downpour on Saturday or something. But um, I think overall, yeah, it was kind of a good um, initiative to to get it up. Um, I suppose having those statistics for people maybe who aren't so sure about racing can now look at it and um, see there's kind of positive stories being made, even though there is there is more to go. Like it's there's no point saying um, racing's in a great place with all this stuff. Um, but it's good to see they're working on it. And um, I think overall, Overall, it's it's definitely a positive. Yeah, and if anyone wants to look it up, it's racingpwr.co.uk. Uh, well worth a look anyway, no doubt about it. Look, we'll move on to some other things. We had some actual racing in Ireland on the turf yesterday in Leopardstown, and Shamie Heffernan stole the show. 50-1 to 1 winner of the Ballysack Stakes for Adrian Murray. Uh, a double on the day for Shamie. What about that, Johnny? The split between... Shamie and Aidan O'Brien. They were together about 28 years. Shamie was down in, in Ballydoyle, one of the best jobs you'd imagine in the world of racing. If you're a jockey, what do you want to aspire to? You want to ride the best horses, best races and everything else. And after 28 years down there, Shamie just said, I've had enough of that. I'm going to go freelance. Strange decision, but obviously it's paying off for him in, on the initial meeting anyway. What do you make of that, Johnny, overall? Yeah, I think um, you might have been the first person in the media, which is quite staggering, really, considering that... Um, the rumor had been doing the rounds. You might have been the first person to report on the likely um, uh, 
severing of the ties there, so to speak, uh, on on this podcast. And um, I, I, to be honest, I can kind of see where Jamie's coming from. You know, sometimes uh, people can be reluctant to um, leave uh, jobs. You know, and I've I've been there myself, where you ha- you have to weigh up. You know, is it is is it a risk worth taking to depart? But like Jamie, um, presumably he's done very well financially out of his um, many years as a jockey, and um, that was actually staggering yesterday to have. Um, to, to ride two horses that's uh you know for 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 outside yards obviously or whatever you want to call them now he's, he's a freelancer the fact like just reading david jennings report from leopardstown i'm my first belly sacks was when yates won it 20 years ago and uh i i'd actually forgotten and um, that he beat dabaroon the horse that ended up winning the first version of the fred winter and lord admiral and um, but but i was reading the so I, I i obviously i've been watching the race for 20 21 renewals now and it never struck my mind that shamey had never won the belly sacks riding a 50 to one shot i i do feel that the ground caught out a lot of horses yesterday um and I, like i i really fancied sean t but by the time he was running making his seasonal debut on the 405 my confidence had kind of evaporated and it seemed that way in the market as well he was so Week because a lot of the Bally Doyle horses had actually kind of run a bit disappointing at that stage. Shamey Twin on a for a fifty to on a fifty to one shot in the race for Adrian Murray, who, um, as he said afterwards himself, was actually thinking of retiring not that long ago. And a, a big day for Charles Weld also. I, I actually messaged him this morning because um he had Morse running in a race at Dundalk. God, I can't even remember when now, but um he looked like he had a great chance that day. And I sort of said, Would you mind giving me an interview pre race? And he said, Oh, I'd prefer to wait till the horse won. And uh, so all these months and months later, he I I, I I was just said I just messed him well done or whatever. And he replied to me, That was the horse that you were asking me to be interviewed about at Dundalk um last year, and he said it took its time, but uh I'm delighted for him as well, and hopefully he can go on to better things. Written for written by Niall McCullough, who might be one of the only jockeys, um, and I'm I'm not even certain he is uh, that's older than Jamie Heffernan in the Wayne room. Yeah, he's certainly one of the veterans, all right. So big day for the veteran jockeys, I presume I'm throwing Jamie into that category as well. Um, of course, Ryan Moore had a good day too. Don't forget that, and so did Aidan O'Brien. Um, another man, Aidan Coleman, 35 years of age. He gave up um, his battle with injury, knee injury he sustained last year. He's tried to get himself back, but he announced his retirement the other day. Um, on Look, on Sunday, actually, I think he announced it. What do you make of that, Emma? It, it's a strange thing there is Aidan Coleman. He, he never rode in Ireland to, under an Irish license. He didn't get his license. He had a problem with an eye and didn't pass the test originally. So he went to the UK and rode there instead. He had a glittering career. Maybe not quite some of the heights you think he might have got to. He chose a wrong one in the Grand National one year, I think. Um, but he rode some nice races. Won a champion chase, didn't he, for Henry de Bromhead as well. Uh, seems like a very nice guy. I don't know him personally. I, I wouldn't know him very well. I think I interviewed him in Punchestown one day. Yeah, a lovely fella. Um, Cork man. I, his brother is training now as well, Kevin Coleman, isn't he? But real natural horseman is kind of what you'd say about Aidan Coleman, I suppose. You kind of remember his association with John Bond, and like John Bond's a tricky horse to ride, and um, he made him look very easy. Paisley Park, I suppose, will probably be the one he's most remembered for with some, some legendary memories with him and was like Epitant and stuff. Kind of a good association with JP over the last year, years in the UK. But He'll be a, he'll be a massive loss. I, I I would have put him up there with probably one of the best um in the UK um right away. You know he's just real natural. He he very very rarely, rarely made mistakes um um on on the high pressure rides either um. But yeah, I was I, I listened to the interview. I was surprised. I was I was kind of wondering. I suppose where he had been. I know he had an injury, but um obviously a so so long time getting back. I think he put a lot of his own money as well into the rehab, trying to get back as quickly as possible. But um. Yeah, he got uh, the bad news that, you know, he, he was never going to be able to get back to kind of the physical um, demands of being a jockey, which is obviously really, really high. So, um, yeah, it's it's kind of, I suppose, being forced into injury isn't ideal for any athlete. But um, I suppose he had a great career to look back on, which is which is a good thing. And hopefully he can find um, another pursuit within racing, because I'd say he, he doesn't seem to be totally finished with the sport yet. No, I think he will. I think he will find him back somewhere. Um but, but you can see the difference between, there's a lad, 35 years of age, would love to keep riding, can't because of injury. And then you see another fella, Frankie de Tory in his 50s, he retires, then he comes back and he rides a six-timer the other day in America again. <laughs> what is the story with that man? I don't know. Sure, he must be due to retire again very soon at this stage. <laughs> what do you think, Johnny? He's still some rider, isn't he? Yeah, um, he's he's some man to retire anyway, but <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's incredible. Like I'd say, I, I haven't, like I've, I'm friendly with um. Some of my cousins love racing in the states, and 
and um, threatening to go back to. I think they're racing in. I think they're racing more in Saratoga this year than Belmont because they might be doing up Belmont. But I'd say Frankie's creating big waves over there. Um, just on Aiden Coleman, um, he, it might be that he'll be used up by his brother Kevin now, who's making a really, really good start to his training career. But um, best of luck to Aiden. I, I, I feel that if you get out in one piece as a jockey, it's almost irrelevant what age you are because um, that's that that it's such a dangerous sport that that's a bonus. Um, but Frankie. Um, he's a great example as well for a fellow who, you know, had had his troubles throughout his life, um, and you know was kind of thrown into um the the role of being a jockey in England at a very very early age by a tough father, I would have said, um, but it's just what an incredible uh, rider he's been, and it's it's a, it's an amazing sport for longevity. You know, Kevin Prendergast still going strong as a trainer, and Frankie arguably riding close to, if not as well as ever. Yeah, and you talk about Aidan Coleman getting out in relatively one piece with a with a bad knee. But look, you look at the poor lad, um, Stefano Cherchi, last week in Australia. That That's tragic stuff, isn't it? And uh, went out there with one of the Irish lads, Owen Walsh, as well. I'd say he's devastated over what had happened. It just really is. You, you see how dangerous this sport is. It is incredibly dangerous. And you never know where it's coming from, particularly for those flat lads as well. It seems to be worse injuries they get when they fall than anyone else. Um, but anyway, moving on. Another one, Tony Martin. Just thought of, mentioned this to some extent. Anyway, we've covered it previously. Um, he got done by the Stuarts over an incident in a horse that won in Dundalk last year, and basically he got a, he got a suspension of his license. But then they suspended that, and they just fined him ten grand. So the IHRB appealed that decision, said it was too lenient. The referral hearing, and um, it turns out he's going to serve three months, start at the end of May or something. I I think it's a good decision. What do you think, Johnny? Was it deserved? Yeah, like I, I in general, um, I get on well with Harvey. Now, I have to say, I've always had a good time for him. Um, his train operation has he probably has a reputation that um, down the years in terms of being like the shrewd handicap king, that isn't necessarily the case anymore. You know, he probably deals a lot of run of the mill horses, and uh, like uh, you know, we've spoken about this before, but I, I, I do feel there, there there needs to be a decent punishment for for stuff like this because it's it's it does bring the game uh, down, and we have to encourage. You know, you see the race and post today, and significant uh, headwinds uh, for jockey club to reduce prize money contribution like the the the, the general um sport of racing is under pressure in terms of people betting on it we need people betting on it and we do need um proper kind of um you know um in terms of the ihrb and how it deals with a case like this I, I think it does need to be done properly and um i i you know I have some sympathy for Tony, and uh, he's a very very sharp operator but you know he, he really does only have himself to blame here i think yeah, third offence was the issue. Um, mm. now, look, there, there's there's no absolute guilt on his part with this at all. Like they can't find where the where the drug came from, lidocaine on the day. They never found the source of it. But at the same time, the trainer is responsible for everything. This is the third time there's been an offence uh, involved here where a horse has tested positive. So you have to be some sanction. And to be it'll honest, be a fair, yeah, it'll be a fair blow to his yard as well. Because I mean, some people are saying having a, a jumps trainer uh, ban in the summer is kind of a bit of a, a a pointless task but like i mean he's you know Galway festival he's kind of i think he's mostly flat now well kind of maybe 50 50 if not more flat as well so it'll be a fair blow to him like in fairness but it's probably fair like considering dennis hogan in a similar case and he got the three months so probably yeah. was the right decision is that i think yeah the other thing with that i just just one little aside in that particular um appeal hearing the other day is the fact they said that when they went into his yard after the horse had tested positive with Dundalk, they did a um an un uh an unannounced raid on his yard and they tested all nine horses they found there seems a very small number of horses to be in tony martin's yard nine horses you would have thought he'd have more than that like going back i'm, I'm looking at the fact that i think he'd, he'd 45 horses ran from last year you'd imagine that there'd be more than nine in at any one time but there you go that's all that was there he's obviously not that not the force he was there was a time he'd have he'd, he was having 40 and 50 winners a year i think going back maybe 10 12 years ago consistently in the top five or six maybe seven trainers in ireland and uh, mainly national hunt as you say then but he uh, he does focus a lot more on the flat now anyway is, one other is thing that, there to um, Vinny, sorry, the, sorry to interrupt his his stats um i saw i saw this lately i was absolutely staggered by the stats he's run um in ireland he's run 80 80 horses over hurdles this year one of them won and that's that's I, I I found that absolutely staggering for a fella that's you know was so feared by the bookies. You look at the way he trained Dune Dara back in the day from 
Martin Mooney winning on him from out of the clouds off one eighty five or something in Navin in a in a two and a half mile handicap hurdle backed off the boards in the days when the the betting ring was alive and going on to win the highest days winning at Cheltenham. Um, it's a far far cry from that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's still, it's still. If he was around for Galway, you'd still fancy him to win a Galway hurdle again. But you're another big handicap there. He's he's still feared in those places and Cheltenham as well. Um. There was all the issues over his good time, Johnny, wasn't it? The handicap mark mm. he was getting for Cheltenham and everything. The English handicap were running scared of him too. So, oh, no doubt, Harvey will be back. Um, one other one from the weekend is Ile France. Looked a star, French horse, and he tailed off last at the weekend. He was 9-4 to four favourite for the King George after his Kempton run at Christmas. And he's out to 8-1 to one now. Could be a good price, hard to know. They think there might be something amiss with him. And um, what's really interesting here is that the cryptic message sent by the stewards after the race, they said jockey James Reevely said the gelding had fallen victim to a physical problem. Examination by the race course vet confirmed his thoughts. Yet they don't tell us what the physical problem was, so I have no idea. But um, there's closed. no doubt there had to be something. Like, yeah, but um, he he looked a hell of a horse at Christmas, didn't he? When he when he won Emma. Yeah, he did, yeah. I suppose it probably was a bit of an overreaction, though, to make him kind of a, a shock price favourite for the King George um, up the back of beating Hermes Allen in, in Kempton. Like, I mean, Hermes Allen's no superstar. Look, it, it probably was an under par performance. I saw some quotes um, from Noel George afterwards uh, saying he was just a bit fresh and he, he was too keen, but uh, you, you'd, you'd, you'd like a bit more than that even then, though. But, yeah, the, the veterinary uh, explanation, uh, it's a bit of a head-scratcher, all right? Um, You'd imagine they would have given a bit more information on that. But uh, I suppose looking at the King George now, like uh, Gaelic Warrior is a uh, favourite at the moment. And maybe they're a bit similar. They can blow out and be very good on their day. But funny, one of the, the very few French races I'd, I'd tune into, if there was kind of an interesting one or an Irish runner, I watched it, yeah. But he was uh, well below par, you'd imagine. Um, but yeah, this probably the, the way anti post betting has gone now, a big performance will, will put you into a short price favourite. Uh, based on a hype probably more so than anything he probably didn't really beat a wall by that day in Kempton either now yeah, talking about anti-post betting and all the rest of it <laughs> what about the Grand National we haven't got runners for it yet but have you got one you fancy for this Johnny you must have something yeah I have a terrible record in the Grand National um, I say this every year I backed Hedge Hunter the year before he won the race um, when he came down was it at the last or the second last having run well and I, I to be honest it's not a race that um it definitely doesn't float my boat like like it does everyone else. Maybe or certainly a lot of racing fans. Like I, I, and I, I've kind of um, you know, the the race has changed a lot over the years. It's obviously become a classier race. But I, I will say, I think that um, you know, the the BHA in terms of their tinkering with the national, um, I think this was a race that actually we, we spoke with the animal rights uh, earlier. Video, but I think this was a race that did need some tinkering. Your stats today. Um, that you, you you know you invoke from that website are quite interesting but this was a race that did have too many fatalities in it and that's just not good enough so um i think they've you know the changes that they made are are um are, are worthy uh, but my selection just there was an interesting article with john mcconnell in the um sunday times yesterday that don mclean wrote um where funnily enough john for for a horse that really does stay all day he was saying he probably doesn't want the ground bottomless so that is a concern, but I, everything else for me about Mallor Mission is a positive, and then you know he's available at fourteen or sixteen to one. Yeah, um, I, I I agree with you. Look largely around the, the Grand National, but I have to say it's always been one of my favourite races. It was the race that got me into horse racing. I say as a kid of about five or six, having me me couple of quid each way on two or three of them. Um, used to be great fun. The whole family sitting around the TV. I I loved it. Um, thirty four runners or whatever this year. The fence is all smaller. It's not quite the same thrill i suppose but at the same time it'd be nice to pick a winner of it uh one i fancy is noble yates won the race in 2022 fought in the race last year a little bit unlucky trained by a man bordering on the state as a genius i think emmett mullins i don't know how he does it horse hasn't seen a fence all season either he's only been running over hurdles but he's got harry cobden booked goes on the ground no matter what the ground is he'll, he'll handle it i think so 20 to 1 he looks a fair price emma what do you make of it <laughs> Um, I'm I'm going to back Willie Mullins to to make up a bit of ground in the trainers championship. I, I really like meet, meeting of the waters in here. Um, to be honest, that he's kind of nicely waiting there. He's on ten seven there. Um, kind of change changeable, I suppose. But uh, I just thought he ran he ran a big race in in Cheltenham in the Ultima. Um, he's got that kind of big race handicap experience. Um, won the Paddy Prowers Christmas as well. Again, won mind the heavy ground. Um, I think yeah, just a novice. He's probably one of the I'd say there's very few novices in it this year and. I'd say he'll have a fair crack at it, and I can see him really staying on strongly towards the end. Um, but yeah, 
maybe one, one for JP, who has a few in there, but I'd imagine this fellow would be Mark's choice. Yeah, so we're, we're both picking ex-Paul Byrne-owned horses. <laughs> he had Noble Yates and sold them uh, to the Whaley Cones. He had Meeting of the Water, sold it to JP. So, yeah, you could be right. Um, it's, it's worked before, buying one off Paul Byrne to win a Grand National, so why not again? <laughs> anyway, look, we'll have a... We'll be looking forward to that this week. Some great racing all through the week. Let's hope entry does go ahead and everything goes smoothly and that there's no fatalities and no issues with it and everything runs nice. And we'll be back next Monday to discuss it all. Thanks for watching and do gamble responsibly and make sure to subscribe to our channel. See you all again next Monday.